the Nile, the Nile was a superhighway. We talked about this. The Nile was a superhighway. It was cheap transportation. If you lived in the south and you want to go north, you push your boat out into the stream and let it carry you north. If you want to go south, you get out of the main stream, the wind blows south, you put the sail up and you sail south. So it was cheap moving long distances as long as you did it on the river. Now there was a lot of traffic on the river. Um, people would make wine and they would give it to a boat captain and say, take us to town and sell it for me and so forth. The people who were doing that wanted to make sure that they could identify which jug their wine was in and so forth. So they made these little square clay tablets with a hole in the corner so they could tie it with a piece of leather around the bottle, around the neck of a, a bottle. And they put a mark on it. And the, the oldest hieroglyphs that we know of, uh, have, there are four of these little, little uh, things that have been dated. And uh, they come from that period around 2,500 years before Christ. And gradually, the number of glyphs or little pictures uh, increased to where you could write words with them and, and eventually well, it was just looked up about a hundred years from the time that those first little chips were seen so there was extensive writing going on. That's pretty quick. Even today in Egypt uh, women uh, are, are a lot better off than uh, in most of the Arabic type countries. Um, you go to Cairo and you, you drive past the American University in Cairo and you see Egyptian college women that are dressed fashionably as though they were here in the United States and so forth. Some of the subjects we're going to talk about. Marriage, the marriage contract. They had prenuptial agreements. Did you know that? Yeah, they did. Uh, Father-daughter relationships. Divorce, adultery, childbirth, children, gender roles, what men normally did and what women normally did. And the work that a woman might do outside of the home. All right. Women married about age 14 or 15, men were a little bit older usually. Many of these were arranged marriages. All of them required parental consent, not consent of the bride. She normally did what her family wanted her to do. Uh, until about the 26th dynasty. Well, the 26th dynasty is like the Greco-Roman period, so the customs uh, were uh, radically influenced by Greeks and Romans who were in Egypt at that time. that what I just said is true, about 95%. The, uh, when the Greeks and Romans came and took over Egypt, they tried to pretend they were Egyptians. They, they wore pharaonic gear. They had themselves carved into walls, uh, looking in the style of the ancient Egyptians, although you could see that uh, the artwork is more intricate uh, than the fairly plain line artwork of the, of the Egyptian artists. Uh, monogamy was common for most uh, commoners, but, in, but the royals, uh, they could have as many um, wives as they could af afford. Marriages could be between stepbrothers and sisters uh, and uncles and nieces. Women could marry above their station, but men rarely married above their station. As a matter of fact, there is a, a fable uh, I guess it's more than a fable. Uh, it's, a, it's a story that may, may or may not be true uh, about a woman who um, claimed, this was uh, about 50 years ago, and darn if I can remember her name, but she wrote a book about her experiences in Egypt. And she believed that she was reincarnated from a, a, a young girl who lived in Egypt uh, in about the uh, 17th dynasty, which would be around uh, 1200 years before Christ. But she believed she had been a y young girl there and uh, fa the Pharaoh whose palace was uh, 50 or 60 miles away, they were building a, a, a temple to Osiris, the lord of the underworld. 
and they had a, a garden there and he would come up to check on the uh, progress of that building and she she was the daughter of a camp follower and a soldier but she was abandoned fairly early and ended up as a as a young girl in training to be a priestess at this uh, location and uh, she was sitting in the garden one day when the pharaoh came up and he wanted to sit down in the garden and she started to run away and he said don't run away Anyway, it turns out that uh, from this from this story that this woman tells, that they fell in love and she became pregnant. Well, it would be against the law for uh, the pharaoh to have sexual relationships with a commoner, so he was going to be in deep trouble, and she was also because she's not supposed to be pregnant. So she committed suicide uh, to save them both this trouble. That's, that's the story that this woman uh, tells in this book that she's written. The legal establishment was not involved. Uh, people decided, it, you know, it was sort of a given, this, this is going to be a marriage. So uh, you pick up your things, you, you gather, you put them together in the same house. Uh, There's no ceremony. Bride uh, moved her belongings to the house of her husband. Now, if he, if he didn't have a house of his own, he was expected to build a house of his own for he and his wife. He m might live with his parents they might live with his parents for a short period of time while he did that. And, and this was a part of the, when I said there was a um, um, prenuptial agreement, this is, this is part of that concept. Uh, the contract established the right to possessions in case of, of a divorce. Uh, the standard marriage contract contained dates, names of partners, and names of parents husband's profession, names of scribes and witnesses, and was kept by a third party. We have extensive records on papyrus and in carvings uh, inside of wall tombs or on, or on the outside of temples uh, that record this kind of information. There have been talk for quite some time about uh, uh, scholars, uh, university guys who were studying ancient Egypt during the period 1800s uh, forward. Um, remember, it wasn't until 1822 that we could read hieroglyphs because uh, this Frenchman Jean Paul Champollion got a hold of the Rosetta Stone, which had hieroglyphic writings, Greek writings, and Coptic, which is another form of Egypt of hieroglyphs. Um, and uh, in the hieroglyphs, which nobody could read, there were five words that were circled with a, a circle like a bathtub, an oval like that, five of them. In the Greek were the names of five kings or queens. And Champollion's first break was, I bet those words in the ovals are names of kings or queens. And then uh, he got a hold of some uh, uh, rubbings on, the, on a inscriptions at the base of a um, of an obelisk in London, which had been carried off to London, and he uh, he got a hold of those inscriptions and was able to make correspondence between certain letters. By this time, he had 25 or 30 letters that he could identify. The mouth stands for an R, the hieroglyph of a mouth, the hieroglyph of an eagle stands for an A, and so forth. So he was making very good progress with that. But. Some of the scholars uh, deny the, base, the existence of any kind of uh, marriage between father and daughter. When you come down to the 18th dynasty, there's a very interesting story about King Tut's wife. He has, King, Tut, King Tut has died. His wife, uh, he, he had no other brother. There was a shady f figure, shadowy figure, named Smenkare, who was thought to be King Tut's brother, but uh, we only have mention of him for about two years and then he disappears, so we don't know what happened to him. But, he, but, but uh, Egypt is at war with some Hyksos, which are tribes up to the northeast in uh, um, where Persia would be uh, and so forth. They were um, at war off and on, quite frankly, because uh, their civilizations were built around uh, wells and, and streams which would dry up and they'd try to go invade Egypt whose major stream never dried up, never dried up. Uh, and so Egypt always had enough food for two or three other countries as well. 
But she writes to this king of their enemies and she says, uh, my husband has died and I have no other man to marry. You got plenty of princes, why don't you send me one of your princes? Uh, and I'll marry him. Well, he, he suspects it. This, his name was uh, his very uh, um, strange name. Uh, I think it may, um, I may remember it or not. But anyway, he, he's not quite sure that he and me and scammed. So he sends a runner down there and the runner comes back and says, yes, it's true. Uh, King Tut has died and there's no male heir that's um, apparent. But what she is saying to him is that she's afraid that she's going to have to marry her grandfather. Um, that his, his name was I, A-Y-E. Now, I like to make a little joke about this, but when, when King Tut died, a lot of, uh, even authors as is, is, uh, late as 50 years ago, were still saying he was killed. King Tut was killed. Uh, we don't think that anymore due to newer evidence, but at that time, uh, there were um, three people who were prominent in the government. One was a general by the name of Horemheb. Hor is the first part of the word Horus, which stands for the hawk-headed goddess, god. And I, who was, uh, uh, ha had been an advisor to the pharaoh before that, he also was related to the pharaoh, so he could claim to be descended from a line of gods. And there was a third man, I've forgotten his name, but I used to th say, well, I'm, uh, I'm going to be a detective and I'm going to tell you who killed King Tut. I did it. It's supposed to be funny. Anyway, so um, stereotype of the, of the old man and the young girl, and there, are, there are cases of that uh, recorded. So it's more than just stereotype. But some believe uh, the titles of the wife and the daughter uh, marks substitute roles and rituals. This uh, avoids the uh, distasteful consummated marriage concept. The problem is that some of these authors uh, base their observations or their interpretations on today's society. Uh, we have no idea how the ancients viewed sex between uh, kings and daughters. Not, re not really any evidence. There was, the state was not involved. There was no marriage license or no, uh, no recording by the state. If there was a recording of a marriage, it was done by a paid scribe who wrote, wrote out perhaps the contract and that, that uh, provided enough information to know about that marriage that had taken place. Divorce could be brought by either party. The husband's reasons, uh, you, you didn't give me a son. Uh, even today, modern Egyptian men feel like their masculinity is diminished if they had not produced a son and so forth. Uh, what are you going to do with these macho guys, you know? Anyway, uh, he wanted to marry someone else or if she stopped pleasing him. Those were his reasons. Her reasons were physical or mental cruelty or, or adultery. And either party was free to remarry. Many men had a second wife because of the death during childbirth or low life expectancy or by, or by divorce. We'll see a little more about that. Married men might have relations with women other than their wives, but not with a woman who was at a, at a cultural station above his, his uh, station. Married women were not. Uh, now, there's a very, a very good reason for this, and that is because when a child is born, we know who the mother was. We always know who the mother was. There's never any doubt who the mother was, but we don't know who the father was. I mean, you know, they didn't have DNA testing back then. So uh, a line of um, genealogy could be precisely known uh, through motherhood. Men were criticized for having affairs with married women. Uh, here again, no stigma was attached to a child born to an other woman. In the negative confession, remember we mentioned this last uh, week, um, this is the recitation of the sins I did not commit, the negative confession. 
uh, one verse reads, I have not copulated with a married woman. Now in that series of slides uh, that we're running here before we got started, there was one sli slide that I kind of wanted to stop on, but the thing was moving and I probably couldn't get to it before it, ch it changed uh, to another slide, but it showed the complete picture of the weighing of the heart ceremony, the dual pan balance, um, the two pans and the weights were put on one pan and the heart is weighed on the other hand. Uh, I, th I think probably next week we'll have that uh, as a part of what's coming up in literature literature next week. And that includes fables, which are rich. Now there's some interesting things here. In childbirth, this is, this is a woman bearing a child. They, they, they have a, a special uh, seat um, <coughs> built for childbirth. Also, there are several references to women giving birth under water. They go into the Nile, and, and you know, neck deep in the water, and have have a child in the water. Um, it helps to support the body to from the buoyancy of the body in water and so forth. Um, you see this little figure right here. I puzzled over that for a long, long time. The face that's on that little figure is the face of the dead person. It's also the face that's on this bird which is called the Bob bird, and it is one of the spirits, uh, one of the th components of the spirit of the ancient man. Uh, last week I told you that uh, if you died and you made your way into heaven, so to speak, well, that's not what they called it, but uh, eternal life is the way they described it. If you made your, made your way into eternal life, by giving the right answers to the negative confession and that sort of thing. Um, you, you would continue to do things in the divine world, the afterlife, that you enjoy doing in the physical world. If you like to play golf in the physical world, you play golf. Well, I don't think they played golf. But uh, they played Senate, which is a board game sort of... Uh, uh, similar to check checkers. It's a, incidentally, it's a really, really neat game. I bought one from the uh, Metropolitan Museum in uh, New York, and it's a fun game, board game. I'm always accused of cheating, and I'm usually am, yeah, but whatever. But um, I, I didn't know what this was. Uh, I, I want to go back to this bird here, the ba component of the spirit, because I, I mentioned last week that that being dead and having eternal life was so real that you wouldn't know the difference between whether you were living in the physical world or the divine world. Pinch yourself or you bang your head on the door or something. The same results, same reaction, same everything in this divine world as in the physical world. And that the only way you could tell the difference, the only way you could tell the difference was uh, if you go out in the sunshine and you look down, you see that your shadow is separated that's not attached to your feet, then you know you're in the divine world. Now, why is that significant? I think I ask you then, who gave you your shadow? Well, it was the sun god Ra that gave you your shadow, okay? And he gave you the shadow to be with you as an uh, alter ego, to stay with you, protect you, and uh, take care of you, and so forth. Now, all of a sudden, you go out in, in the sun, your shadow is standing over you or someplace. You know that you're dead. Now, this little bird, Bob bird, is related to that shadow. And the Bob bird has a, a role in the afterlife. You see, this is a picture of the ceremony to decide whether the uh, dead guy is going to get to go to heaven, going to get eternal life. Let me see. I don't see the hieroglyphs in that in that. Uh, there, there, there are two hieroglyphs. One is a pyramid, and the other, the other is an ankh. You know the ankh? It's a straight chain loop up top with a cross going across like that. Sir Alan Gardner says that's a, that's a sandal strap. The, the loop goes around your ankle. This goes across the side of your foot, and the long one goes down between your toe. So the ankh, A-N-K-H, ankh. And a lot of people wear ankhs today as a talisman, a good luck piece, and so forth. But, but it's a symbol for life or living. And when you see these hieroglyphs together, you see an ankh and a pyramid, it means living forever or 
uh, eternal life. Pyramids are the hieroglyph is of a pyramid is a is a symbol for a word like eternal. It's always going to be there, eternal. Well, you see, the the Ba bird, his job is to fly with the sun god during the day. Sun god, sun god is born every day uh, in Knoxville and dies every day in Memphis. Every day, every day eternal life, born again sun god over uh, Memphis, uh, or over Knoxville rather, east. Uh, and, the, and the bob bird flies with the sun god. So how's he going to, as a shadow, how's he going to be around stick his shadow up against your foot during the day if he's out there flying with the sun god? Can't do it. That's how you know the difference between you're in the divine world or you're in the, in the physical world. Now, uh, w when he dies with the sun god at Memphis, sundown, uh, what he does is he goes back and, and rests his spirit in the mummified body of the guy that died. Okay? That's his role. But going back to this little image right here, I, it took me several years before I found out what that is. Uh, is John Romer's book. I think I may have mentioned him. Uh, he's, he's not... He's not as, he hadn't sold as many books as a lot of other authors, but he was a good scholar. This is a birthing block. It's like a, a concrete block with the head of a person on it, and there are two of them, and the pregnant woman stands, squats with her foot on each of those blocks to deliver the baby. I think the only reason that that appears repetitively in scenes of the weighing of the heart this is the dual pan balance. The other pan is over here with the feather on it, the feather weight, to see whether your heart is lighter than a feather, or as light as, or is weighed down by dirty deeds and so forth. Um, the, the only reason to have that there is perhaps to symbolize the beginning of a new life, a new eternal life, a, different, a new life in the spiritual or divine world. I haven't seen anybody explain to me why uh, that appears in that scene, so I have to I have I have freedom to make my own guess about about why it is there. Birthing seat here it's mentioned here. Yeah, the the uh, um, two goddess Hathor and Tuaret uh, usually are present on this. Uh, Hathor and Tuaret are both um, goddesses of female. Of fertility. You remember Hathor is the uh, cow goddess of joy, dancing, and laughter, and Tuaret is the hippopotamus uh, goddess of, uh, of childbirth, f female fertility. All right, so here are some toys I thought were fascinating. Children were a blessing who cared for their parents when their parents were old. The oldest child arranged the funerary provisioning. Infants and child children were protected and cared for. Uh, you see, one of the um, verses from the negative confession is, I, I did not fail to take care of the orphans, orphans, the widows and children. Infant mortality was high, so uh, one death for every two or three uh, births. But these, these are high-tech toys, you see. These are, well, these are automated toys. I mean, you take a hold of that stick right there and you can make that frog eat the fly, you know. Well, where you can make this woman uh, uh, knead the bread, she's making a loaf of bread. Or you can make this, I'm not sure, this may be a hippopotamus, but it may be a, a, a vanished animal, I don't know, it doesn't seem clear to me exactly what it is. But this is one of my favorites. Underneath, I, I have other, fig, fig, I have um, exploded view of that toy. So you can see what's underneath. And there are little pulleys. And these strings, you pull these little strings in and out, and, and the guys go dancing around this way and that way and so forth. They are like dwarfs and pygmies from southern parts of uh, Africa. Sir? Yes? If the infant mortality was that high, what about the mother? What about the? Is there statistics on 
the mother. Uh, not that I know of. Uh, not that I know of, but uh, I don't think it was uncommon uh, to lose a woman in childbirth. Um, there's a temple on the southern part of the Nile called, uh, at a place called Asna, it's a Temple of Horus. And that is a fairly new temple. It's big and it's in very good shape. But it was it was built in the Greek or Roman period. So we see, uh, it was built during the time for from about 300 uh, years before Christ. So we're, we're, it's not in a category with those who were built 2,500 years before Christ. You know, big a big time difference there. But on the back wall of that temple, there's a the, the temple has like a alleyway. Uh, a reasonably high wall, maybe 12, 14 feet high, and then a space probably 12, 14 feet across, and then the temple sits here, but this alleyway runs straight down the right-hand side across the back and then uh, up the other side. On the very back wall of that is a medical text, and uh, I remember very clearly looking at a uh, big carving in that wall that showed all of the uh, doctor's instruments. Uh, on that well surgeon surgeons and incidentally modern uh, modern medicine uh, Gray's Anatomy those people got a huge amount of information from the mummification work that the ancient Egyptians did you see part of the mummification process was to take out the internal organs um, the liver the lungs the spleen and the intestines and put them in little jars called canoptic jars these little jars were sometimes made out of clay, sometimes made, occasionally made out of gold for royal people. King Tut's were made out of a beautiful white marble, and then there was a gold head that sat on the top of, this was a, his was a square box with four chambers, and four gold heads of King Tut's sit looking at, at each other on, the, on that uh, box. But in the process, oh, and while we're talking about mummification, I may have mentioned last week the people doing the mummification didn't want to do the first cut because that guy might get out of the grave and come get you. So they always hired somebody, a beggar, to make the cut, and he would make the cut and run. He got out of there in a hurry. There's another aspect that uh, not very pleasant, but wealthy people, when a beautiful woman died, they would keep the body for several days before they send it to the undertaker. The husband work outside the home, the wife manages the house and children, and um, the goddess Nekbet that we uh, uh, um, talked about last week, uh, Neftis, Neftis, is the goddess of the house, lady of the house, and she is the uh, goddess that is uh, prayed to by women who, who manage the house. Uh, I they could do this in the house, manufacturing linen cloth. Uh, these kilts that you see uh, drawn, uh, that, that's not a typical kilt because he has a uh, scarf that comes down in front, but a lot of times that kilt is starched and stands out front uh, like that. And those kilts are made of, of linen, and, and uh, so women made that in the homes. They also did grinding of grain, making of beer and bread. Um, Women were not confined to the house. They could own land and rent, rent land and farm it. They held positions as scribes. This was a, this was, this was a, this was a high-tech position for a woman. Um, it, it, was a, it elevated her in the, in the status in society because it means she can write hieroglyphs. And so people would come to her to have them write the marriage contract or to record a will or to... Um, do any kind of uh, transaction that they wanted a written a written record of maybe one of these uh, prenuptial agreements. So being a scribe was a uh, now there are there are many statues of scribes and they are all what we call block sculptures where the artist has taken a stone that's probably three feet high and two and a half to three feet side on each side of the rectangular. Uh, squarish block and then boil that cut that down to a seated scribe with his uh, knees crossed and a pallet sitting in, in his lap and uh, sometimes uh, writing utensils in his, in his hand and there are many more sculptures of uh, men scribes than of female scribes but there are several drawings of female scribes and in some 
papyrus drawings, uh, a woman is seated in a chair and you can see a, uh, a um, stylus and uh, ink pots uh, underneath her chair, which is a symbol that she had status as a, as a scribe. The ink pots are, I call them ink pots, it's actually a board with a hollow, two hollowed out places, one for black ink and one for red ink. Uh, overseers, inspector of treasures, sealer, um, beaters, and, and beaters, uh, when grain is harvested, uh, the uh, beaters uh, beat the uh, stalks with grain on it to knock the kernels of grain off. And uh, sometimes the, the uh, uh, men come by with shovels and throw that up into the air so that the wind will blow uh, the leaves away and, and the gr grain will fall to the ground. A bird catcher. Now, that's interesting. Um, I, I, King Tut has uh, half a dozen or so sticks in his tomb that were found that are called bird, bird sticks. And we have drawings of, uh, of a guy throwing a bird stick. And I was thinking, this is not an Australian boomerang over which a skilled man can have some pretty good control and hit what he's trying to hit without hitting himself in the back of the head. Uh, but I didn't see how those uh, bird sticks would work until I finally figured it out. Uh, he didn't throw that stick at a bird. He sneaks up on a flock of birds that are all sitting still, and then he yells, get up in the air. When they all go out, he throws it at the cra crowd and just hits whoever he's going to hit. You know, but when it falls down to the ground, he'll go over and stomp him in the head and take him home for dinner. There are three levels of activities uh, described for women. Uh, those who were well connected or educated, those with skills uh, or talent of some sort, and those with little skill. Uh, here, here we see a woman who's following along behind perhaps her husband and they're plowing in a field of grain. Uh, this actually has, uh, is a painting from a tomb, very elegant tomb of a nobleman. Um, and uh, often in the paintings in tombs, they are done in what are called registers, which is a, a band with a story being told in pictures that are painted. Then there'll be another band underneath that, and it's called a register. So there, there are lines that delineate uh, one, one register from another. And, and this painting, that's just a small excerpt. Uh, it's a fairly large painting. and. Uh, it shows the man who owns the fields, and it shows uh, other people working in, in the fields. So, uh, the well-connected well or educated women could do uh, professional posts. Uh, they, uh, particularly if they had an ability to, to write hieroglyphs, uh, they were domestic administrators. They could run a, a household for a more wealthy man, perhaps. Uh, they were supervisors of female activities. That's, those, are, those are the good jobs. Uh, this highest ranking administrator that we know of uh, had several titles, and these are, these are the titles that she had. Sole royal ornament, companion of the king, countess, and I, I think that's probably uh, a, a British archeologist choice of word to describe what he translated from the hieroglyphs. Uh, hereditary princess, daughter of Geb, the earth god, daughter of Meheru, daughter of Toth, daughter of Horus, she of the curtain, judge and vizier. Now vizier is kind of like um, a county commissioner. The, uh, the land was divided into gnomes, uh, G-N-O-M-E, as gnomes, uh, uh, Hmm. I wonder if that's uh, derived from a, a word related to names, G-N-O-M-E-S. But uh, in any event, Vizier was the chief administrator of that organization. He collected, collected taxes for the Pharaoh, he or she. Oh, let me make a comment about this. Uh, this woman's name is Hennu Tawi. Ta and this picture is taken from the tomb of her husband, which is, he was a nobleman. He died before she did. She decorated that tomb 
He's got a lot more pictures of her in it <laughs> than it does of him. She's a very, very attractive lady. And um, she's painted, it, it, the, the dating of that tomb is confused by her breast. There are two p pictures of her, and in one, her breast is prominent. Her, her upper body, uh, from, from the shoulders on down, is in profile, and it's frontal uh, from the shoulders up, as are many of the paintings. But in one of them, her breast line is a fairly smooth, non-pronounced at all. In another one of the paintings, it's obvious. And so those correspond to two periods in which the style of painting differed drastically. And so it's possible that part of that tomb was done at one time for a different person and then taken over later by a different person who decorated it uh, differently. It's a very nice tomb. If you have uh, a chance to go to Egypt, uh, I would advise you to not miss the, uh, everybody's going to the Valley of Kings. You know, see King Tut's tomb and Tutmosis III's tomb and Amenhotep III and see Hatshepsut's temple and all this kind of thing. But the Valley of the Queens has the temple of Nefertari, who was the wife of Ramses the Great. And that tomb, that tomb had been extensively renovated and the colors restored. And it was about a 25 year project that was completed, I think, in 1969. And it is a beautiful tomb. Uh, we, I believe we're going to visit that tomb in the fifth or sixth lecture of this, of this series we're doing right now. If so, you'll see how vivid the colors are and how beautifully done. Um, well, if you're the wife of Ramses the Great, you ought to have a pretty nice tomb, you know. They may be employed uh, in female industries such as music, dancing, or mourning. These people, these are uh, dancers in a parade. Uh, three musicians. I have a little, a little uh, plast, uh, ceramic wall plaque reproduction of that. Uh, those three uh, images right there. All right. One of the professions is professional mourner. Okay. Uh, the guy died and he didn't have a lot of friends, we'll hire mourners. You can tell that they're mourners uh, particularly because their hands are, are facing their face, they're throwing ashes on their head and on their face. And I'll say a word about this, uh, see she, she is also has the throwing ashes on her, on her head and so is the lady at the bottom there. This is Anubis, the jackal-headed god. He is the lord of the underworld, and he starts, once, once you leave the undertaker's place, and you're mummified, and you got this Johnson gauze uh, wrapped all around you, uh, he takes you across the river, and he takes you by the hand and leads you through this ceremony, this weighing of the heart ceremony. So he is, he is like the guide to the underworld. Now I'm gonna, now I'm gonna give you a uh, speculation why he is a jackal-headed humanoid why would uh, ancient theologians to for lack of a better term choose a jackal as the guide to the underworld all right here's my speculation okay uncle joe died he was a good old guy and um, you know way back then we used to take you know, dead guys out and bury them in the sand in the desert. I mean, the poor people, they didn't have, have any better way of get, getting rid of the body. And they found out that the uh, animals would eat, eat the body. So for they started piling rocks on top of the dead guy. When they pick him out in the sand, if the animals didn't get to him, the body stayed in very good condition for a very long time because the, the desert is uh, deliquescent. It sucks the moisture out of everything. And uh, as long as there's no moisture, uh, biological deterioration processes cannot occur. Okay, so, uh, so uh, the, the, the problem is um, these rocks didn't always uh, keep the jackal from uh, getting to the body. So they started taking a big rock. Uh, and it was initially the early ones were like a foot and a half high, maybe five or six feet long. The ancient Egyptians were generally not tall people, generally. 
uh, and they put that big block over it and it did pretty good and that block was called a mastaba which is uh, the ancient word for bench and it became a place where the relatives would take a picnic lunch and go and sit on this bench remember their dead ancestor and so forth uh, when the mummification process is done the jaw muscles uh, um, stricture the, the jaw becomes tightly clenched there's a ceremony called the opening of the mouth ceremony in which a man comes up with an adze and pries open the mouth of the dead person so that dead person can spiritually receive food and drink and there's a, a lector priest who stands by reading a scripture that accompanies that uh, opening of the mouth ceremony domestic servants uh, could could serve uh, as servant role in uh, the wealthy in a home of a wealthy person for instance or anyone who could afford uh, servants uh, they people could do weaving and uh, making bread we'll talk a little bit about the, har the harem or harem um, I think we mentioned last week that there were titles that uh, the first pharaoh of the 18th dynasty uh, Amos uh, bought titles from the priests for his wife and one of these titles was uh, God's wife here are some of the here are some of the um, favored positions uh, titles that you can have as a woman in the harem I should say a word about that pharaohs uh, had Egypt had uh, satellite countries that were buffers between them and their really bad enemies like we have Japan it's a satellite country and somebody going to attack Japan before they attack us that's our theory uh, South Korea satellite country <laughs> okay um, anyway uh, God's God's wife was one of these titles that he bought from oh, I was, was going to talk about Amos the uh, first pharaoh uh, of the 18th dynasty uh, he struck some blows for women's lib uh, I think we go into this um, maybe on the next uh, slide but I'll come back to to what Amos did that made women's lives m much better and more enjoyable and so forth so uh, if, if you ran the king's household you had a favored position in the harem uh, if you were the principal wife or God's wife uh, you had a uh, you had a, you actually had you, you got out of the harem if you were the God's wife or the principal wife he he would uh, uh, set up a plantation for you you could be just one of the harem women now wh when we get into the literature I think it may be the, the next session next week uh, we're going to talk about how the women of the harem decided to kill the Pharaoh uh, because they had a son that they wanted him to be the next Pharaoh and so let's get rid of this guy now and there were two instances recorded where women in the harem organized a plot and actually hired people from outside uh, of Egypt to help um, with with that if you were the king's mother uh, that was a favored position now you see if you're a woman in the harem and you're really trying to get out what you really want to do is attract the Pharaoh's attention and bear him a son if you bear him a son you're on the way out you're going to have a house of your own you're going to have servants you're going to have land that you can have his servants farm and so forth Pharaoh Amos part of my E is missing there uh, this woman Teta Sherry uh, was a very important wife of a Pharaoh and I'm going to read you some uh, text that is, that is written about her but before we get to that um, th this fellow here second Henry Tao was the last Pharaoh uh, in the 17th dynasty now you're going to like this the Hyksos were this tribe from uh, up northeast of Egypt and they had come in down and they had taken over the Delta uh, the place where the Nile goes up branches off into this Delta shape and all these little tributaries dump into the Mediterranean Sea 
and they'd taken over the delta, which is a really nice uh, a vegetable growing, uh, agriculturally very productive area. So Egypt was divided. Part of Egypt was in the hands of foreigners. And second Henry Tao uh, was, was the pharaoh, but he was the pharaoh of, of what we call Upper Egypt, which is down south. because It's upper because its elevation is higher. The Nile flows north. Well, uh, uh, the fellow up, up the, uh, there, the, the king up there, his name was uh, Apophis, I believe. He sends a note to Second Henry Tao, and he's really wanting, he's just pulling his tail. He says, the hippopotamuses in your ponds are making so much noise, I can't sleep at night. He's 300 miles away. Okay. Okay. Well, Second Henry Tao decides it's time to get the army together and get rid of these guys. So we have a picture of him after he, he was killed in battle, and he, he did not manage to throw uh, the Hyksos out of the Delta. He, he did not manage to do that, but he made a big impact. And he had, his oldest son was a fellow named Kamos. Uh, Kamos carried the battle on after Second Henry Tom was killed in battle. He was killed, we have a photograph of his body. It shows an ax wound, uh, arrow wound, a knife wound, and a spear wound. He's, he was killed many times in, in battle. His son, Kamos, took over, and it didn't quite get the job then. Then a second son named Amos, he took over, and he managed to kick the Hyksos out. So he was the successful guy that did that. And he became the first pharaoh of the 18th dynasty. His, his wife was Amos Nefertari. He got rid of the Hyksos. Uh, he built a temple and a, and a stela, or stela, it's a German word, uh, to his grandmother, and he bought these titles, God's Wife and Divine Adoratress. He bought those titles from the priests at the Great Temple of Karnak for his wife. German word stela means post, and it was used uh, in very olden times to mark the end of territory. Uh, there'd be scripts, you know, and they'd say, this is, the, this is the boundary of the property, whatever. They were also used kind of as billboards. If the, if the pharaoh wanted people to know something, he would have several of these uh, inscribed, carved, and then located at various points around the country. I want to read you uh, something about, uh, a cenotaph is uh, like a false grave, uh, a, a lure to fool grave robbers doors that won't open, they're just painted on the wall, and that, that kind of thing. Uh, at Abydos, or Abydos as the Egyptians say, where Osiris was buried, uh, he uh, almost gave uh, a, this uh, temple he built for her uh, at Abydos with uh, priests to provide offerings. Now I'm going to read a little bit about Tedesheri. This first um, is um, an interpretation of the Donation Stella text. Um, in month three of inundation, inundation day seven, under the majesty of the king of Upper and Lower Egypt, Nebetere, the son of Ra, Amos, living forever and ever, given eternal life. Done in the presence of the magistrates of the lands of Thebes and the priests of the temple of Amun, what was said in the majesty of the palace, life, prosperity, health. I have given the office of the second priest of Amun to the God's wife, great royal wife, that is his wife. She united to the beauty of the white crown, Amos Nefertari, his wife, may she live, was done for her in that which is in the house from son to son, heir to heir, five without a lying, a challenge against it by anyone forever and ever. Now let me tell you what that says. Um, a woman could inherit property from her, from her family but once she inherited it, it wasn't hers anymore. It was his, her husband's to deal with. So she did not have the, if she wanted to leave that property to her daughter, she couldn't do that. That was family property, was managed by him. Almost, never, almost changed that. He changed that. He said, you know, uh, not only that, but um, heir to heir, without allowing a challenge against it by anyone forever and ever. Nobody can change that now. And it goes on to say what he has uh, 
given to her, uh, his wife. Now we talk a little bit about uh, Teta Sherry. Well, this, this is from, um, I believe it's a book by Gay Robbins, who's a, a woman Egy Egyptologist at Emory University in Atlanta. I believe she wrote this. The position which Teta Sherry occupies in Egyptian history is extremely interesting. She was the first of a line of remarkable women who exerted unusual influence in their days. At Teta Sherry's death, her daughter, Ahotep, became regent during the absence of Amos, her son, at the Nubian campaigns. See, he's down south uh, fighting some rebellious uh, folks down there. At Ahotep's death, later in the reign of Amos, it was Nefertari who became the great uh, personage, and she survived at least until the coronation of Totmosis I. Her daughter, Ahotep XI, and her Ahotep II, and her granddaughter, Amos II, carried on in the tradition until finally the latter's daughter, Hatshepsut, Hatshepsut, remember, the only female pharaoh. Okay? Um, we'll talk more about her in the lectures coming up. Uh, became the actual acknowledged ruler of Egypt. I think I told you that she declared herself uh, Pharaoh and the priest said, no, you, you, you can't do that because you're not descended from a line of gods. And she said, ah, yeah, but what you don't know is that when I was conceived, my mother was visited by the god Amun, who appeared to her disguised as her husband. And the priest said, that's pretty clever. She, we can't deal with that. She must be the pharaoh. So she became the, the only female pharaoh. Other women became queen, but uh, the hieroglyphs actually say the woman who is king. They don't, they don't uh, talk of her as... Pharaoh comes from two words, per aoa, which is the big house. He's the guy that lives in the big house. And it's a, it is a masculine uh, designation. Uh, Hatshepsut became the actual acknowledged ruler of, of uh, Egypt. Teta Sherry rested in her Theban tomb for nearly six centuries until the brig brigandage, brigandage in the necropolis, that is uh, Thebes, became so uncontrolled that it was necessary to gather up the royal mummies and move them from place to place out of danger of the thieves. Most of them had been robbed, and Teta Sherry's body had been stripped of its grave clothes by the time it was carried to the hiding place in Deir el-Bahari. I wish I could stop and tell you about Deir el-Bahari. Uh, there was so much robbing going on in the, in the Valley of the Kings and the Valley of the Queens that the priests decided to gather up 80 some odd mummies of royal people and hide them. And if you were, if you were on the Nile looking east towards Hatshepsut's temple, you'd have a mile, mile and a half of flat land and then there's 1,300 foot very sheer cliffs going up to high desert from then on. These priests came from the high de desert and dropped down uh, 60, 70 feet but with ropes to a tiny little ledge, bored a hole in this thing going down 30 feet and then about another 30 meters back this way and they hid these mummies, 80, 80 mummies in here. Uh, some local farmers uh, lost a goat and they could hear it braying and they thought it might have fallen in a hole and they looked, they sent one of their guys down to this ledge the, the, apparently the goat or donkey died and was smelling bad and there maybe some buzzards were pointing out there's something halfway down this cliff they let one of their guys down there and he climbed down that thing and he, he, he came out and he says, you know, you, you ain't going to believe what's here. So he found all, all these golden objects that had been buried by these priests who hid these mummies. This place is called Deir al-Bahari. And they, for probably 10 years, were taking little pieces of gold out of there and, and going over across the river where, where English tourists were coming through there and selling pieces of gold to tourists. Now, there's a guy at the uh, uh, museum in Cairo, Maspero, Gaston Maspero. He's the head curator at the museum. Somebody uh, at an auction in London is auctioning this little statue, uh, ceramic porcelain statue, and it's marked Penegem. Penegem. Now this little statue, I got probably 12, 14 of those in a little cabinet in my living room. Uh, it's called an Ubshati, and those the statues are the answerers 
when the Pharaoh dies and is mummified and in the spiritual world he's called to go to work in the fields to harvest the grain, they answer for him. So they're spiritually very valuable and they're buried with the Pharaoh. Now, Maspero knows nobody has ever found the tomb of Penegem. Nobody knows where the tomb of Penegem is. So if nobody knows where the tomb of Penegem is, how did this Ubshati end up on an auction table in, in London? Somebody knows. Well, there was a woman, cannot remember her name, uh, she wrote a book uh, called A Thousand Miles Up the Nile, and uh, she, she wrote wonderfully about her, her uh, it would have been 1887, uh, maybe 1888, somewhere along in there, maybe 10, 10 years earlier than that. She said, she wrote to Maspero, she said, there are rumors down here in the southern part of Egypt about a, a, a beautiful, wonderful tomb that contains a lot of riches, but nobody knows where it is. Well, Maspero had the cops go down there, and they beat up on the locals and uh, tried to get some information out of them, and nobody would talk. And uh, Maspero, uh, a few years later, the, these brothers who were robbing stuff out of this tomb at Deir al-Bahari, uh, got to fighting among themselves. And uh, the situation was so bad that they were, there was a cop sitting on the elbow of each one of these guys, and finally the oldest brother said, you know, I give up, we're gonna, we, we can't do this anymore. So he went to town and said, yeah, we found a, we found a, a tomb where a lot of burials and there's a lot of gold stuff in there, you know. Well, they sent a message, message up to Cairo to Maspero. Maspero says, nah, nah, I've been through this once. I'm not going down there again. He sent his right-hand man, uh, Emil Brugsch, a uh, German guy down there. You should read what Brugsch has to say, you know. They put him down in this hole. They lowered him down this cliff. And you should, you should read... Uh, what he has to say. He said, I cannot believe my eyes, you know. Of these 80 mummies, 40 of them were royalty. 40 of them were royalty. He hired these people to lower these things down that another 12, uh, thousand foot to the ground. Mummies were laid out down there on boards you know, like this in the hot sunshine. And the uh, Arabs from across the river in Luxor were hired to uh, help transport these things, take them to barges, put them on a barge and float them up to Cairo. The mummies laid out there in the sun for such a long time that the mummy of one of the Ramses' arm raised up from the sun on it. It scared all the Arabs and they quit work and he had to go and, and talk them back into. When those mummies were put on barges and the barges were floated down the river, the Egyptians lined the river clapping and singing and it was just a great celebration that their kings uh, were going to find a home in the Cairo Museum and so forth. Great story. Okay, back to Teta Sherry. Her body had been stripped of its grave clothes by the time it was carried to the hi hiding place in the air of Al-Bahari. That's that hole in the ground. Either then or during the final move to Cairo some 40 years ago, the bandages on which her name was written had been separated from her mummy. Recently they have been rediscovered in the Cairo Museum and there doubtless lies her mummy unknown to the present generation. Okay, we'll talk about uh, Teta Sherry, uh, Amos, uh, she had a, uh, this t temple at Abydos where Osiris was buried and we talked to her a little bit about her importance in the uh, running of the country when the Pharaoh was uh, out going to war with somebody or so forth. Mm -hmm. Here's another one of the titles that uh, almost bought, the Divine Adoratress. Uh, the spar, the, the uh, uh, star is the mark of the divine world. The loaf of bread is a female designator and this is the word for the gods, worship of the gods and so forth. Before 1490, the title belonged, uh, before about 1490, the title belonged to the daughter of the chief priest of Amun at Karnak, at that big 26-acre religious, largest religious complex in the world. And then uh, it disappears, this title disappears and shows up again uh, later, well, 15 years later, uh, on the mother-in-law of Tutmosis III, the great warrior um, Tutmosis III. They called him, uh, the French at least, called him the Napoleon of ancient Egypt. In the third intermediate period, it was this title was associated with the title God's Wife of Amun. 
some women wore both titles, uh, Divine Adoratress and uh, uh, God's Wife of, of Amun. Here's the title, God's Wife of Amun. It appears in the 18th dynasty. Remember, the 18th dynasty is the pinnacle of art, literature, painting, sculpture, probably music. We don't really know that much about the music. And here is the major change brought about by Amos in the inheritance title brought about by Amos. His wife uh, is in endowed position, granted in perpetuity. And you, you heard the words about nobody has a right to challenge that. It's, if you're a woman and you inherit property from your family, that's your property. If you want to will that to your daughter, you, you have a right to do that now. You couldn't do that before Amos. He established valuable and productive lands, uh, priests to farm the land, and a manager for the lands. Now, the donation stella, stella uh, is the, uh, this is the drawing of what's on that. And it describes the, what he has said. I think I may have, uh, uh, in the month of inundation, day seven, under the majesty of the king of upper and lower Egypt, the son of Ra, Amos, living forever, and they were done in the presence of the magistrates, etc. Um, I have given the office of the second priest of Amun to the god's wife, great royal wife. She united to the beauty of the white crown. Amos Nefertari, may she live. It was done for her in that which is in the house from son to son, heir to heir, five, without allowing a challenge against it by anyone forever and ever. And then there's a list of what, it, what the title included uh, gold, copper, clothing, ornaments, wigs, etc., etc. He, he also goes on, I have given to Amos Nefertari, his wife, male and female servants and 400 oip, those are, that's 8,000 quarts of barley and six aruars, three acres of inundated land as an excess over the 1010 chenau, and I don't know what the chenau is. Her office will be at the value of 600 chenau. The office is completed for her, it being endowed. This title, if you follow the, uh, the writings of some of the women authors who have historically studied ancient Egypt and have written uh, books on this, a woman named Till Desley up at Brown University and this lady, uh, Gay Robbins at, uh, at Emory University in Atlanta and several, several others. Uh, one, of the, one of the good books is called The Daughters of Isis. Uh, that's, that's a very good one. But uh, this title uh, can be followed, and these are, these are women who wore the title, and it can be followed all the way down to Cleopatra, uh, you know, near the time of Christ, like, what, 80, 80 years before uh, the time of Christ, something like that. You can see that there are gaps. Uh, she wore the title, you know, from 1570 to 1546. That's a pretty long period. And then you see there's a gap between it. It next shows up at 1551. Actually, that's an overlap and going to 1524. Um, here's an overla uh, empty space. It shows up last in 1504 and then doesn't show up again until about six years later, uh, 1496, 1498. But it's interesting that this was such an important, I mean, when you look at just the, the years that we're talking about here, uh, we're talking about a 500 year period that that title is, is being uh, um, um, willed to the daughter of a, a royal woman. Now we're going to talk about one more uh, title. Actually can't see it, but the title is God's Hand. I refer you back to this uh, God Atum, who was the original creator God. Uh, and one of the theories of creation was that he created uh, the earth by masturbating and created man and woman but from that act. And, and you, you'll recognize some of the gods and goddesses that we've talked about earlier. And of course, the females are put in pink here and the men in, in white. But this title, The God's Hand, refers to the hand that Atom used to create the earth. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if I brought text um, about that. The title refers to the hand that Atom used to create the earth. The word hand is feminine in Egyptian. Therefore, you see the, the female determinative that says we're talking about a woman here. God's hand. Uh, 
in Egyptian easily personified as a goddess, both the god's wife and god's hand had sexual connotations. Some authors believe the function was to, visual, to ritually stimulate the god so that he would continually recreate the world. Although the specific function is not known, we do know that sexual activities were not permitted uh, in the temples. Does anybody have any question? What, uh, in the transition from one, as we, I a long time, and the modern times are, are viewing the ancient times, the, the transition from one dynasty to the next, from the 17th to the 18th, that we were looking at, how was the transition defined? A good question. You had the, you had the father and, and the first son, and the first son failed to defend the, the kingdom or kingdom yes. picks us out, whatever. The second son yes. achieved that, that. And then at some point, I mean, I, I, that was defined as the beginning of a new dynasty. Yes. What, good question. You know, good, from, good question. It's, it's, a, it's a question often asked. Okay. And uh, to some extent, it's slightly arbitrary, although in that particular instance that you're talking about, where you have second Henry Tao, he went off to battle and got killed. His son Kamos tried to run the guys out, couldn't do it. Now, here's a new dynasty because the third son, or the uh, uh, next younger son, Amos, ran him out. And the historians believe that the expulsion of the Hyksos was such a historic incident that we're going to begin a new dynasty, the 18th dynasty, start with Amos. So in some cases, uh, it was a, a generational uh, loss of lineage. Um, no heir, no author. Right, no, no heirs, no, right. So some cases were those. Other cases, there were a historic incident that was so significant that the times changed radically. I think even without uh, Amos running the Hyksos out, if you looked at if you looked at the artwork of the 17th dynasty and earlier dynasties, and the jewelry uh, and uh, statuary, the carvings and so forth, you would say that the 18th dynasty was so much better in, in their artisan work, uh, uh, the paintings of the tombs and this kind of thing, that you would say this is, a, this is a new generation sort of thing. Any sense of what led to the flourishing of the arts in the well, the unity, uh, the unifying of Egypt and kicking the Hyksos out was a big thing because the, the Pharaoh, uh, he has some obligations, like he's, he, he has to feed some people uh, that don't have any uh, other support. They're going to help build a pyramid or something, and so they're away from home while they're building the pyramid, so he's got obligations and whatnot, and now he doesn't have to put as much money you know, like, we're putting a lot of money into defending Japan. Right, and in, <laughs> you our, know? in our time, if your national treasure is going elsewhere for external events, you're not able to concentrate internally True. to whatever it's there. Exactly, exactly. Then, okay, well, I hope to see you all next week, and I uh, hope we have better weather. <laughs> Thank you for coming.